بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا اللهم وهب لنا رأفته ورحمته وعونه ودعاءه وخيره ورضاه ما ننال به سعة من رحمتك وفوزا عندك يا كريم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين For the hastening of the reappearance of the Master, the Savior, the Avenger, the Mawla Al-Hujjat ibn al-Hasan al-Askari recite aloud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad <coughs> My dear brothers and sisters, scholars, elders, Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Continuing from last night's discussion, I did leave a few points out due to the lack of time, so I want to quickly cover those points, insha'Allah. We mentioned that Imam Zain al-Abideen in his fiery sermon in the presence of the tyrant Yazid demonstrated greater valor and courage even than Prophet Ibrahim when he was being catapulted into the biggest man-made fire. The resolve of the Imam, the bravery of the Imam speaking with him in that tone, saying to him, إِنْ قُلْتَ أَنَّهُ جَدُّكْ فَقَدْ كَذَبْتَ وَكَفَرْتَ I mean that statement in and of itself, you're a liar, you're an imposter, you're an apostate if you make this claim. It was an incredible moment of light in the midst of utter darkness and gave the family members of Aba Abdullah al Hussein the courage to withstand the incredible pressure and not be not feel broken after the atrocities and calamities that they faced on the plains of Karbala and all the way toward Kufa and Sham. And the Imam started off by saying that we, and only we, have been endowed with knowledge. And we spoke a little bit about that. So he says, Utina al-ilma wal-hilm وَالْفَصَاحَةَ وَالسَّمَاحَةَ وَالشَّجَاعَةَ وَالْمَحَبَّةَ فِي قُلُوبِ النَّاسِ The Imam says that we've been endowed with knowledge, we've been endowed with the ability to suppress our anger, and we talked about that as well. And then he says we've been endowed and gifted with eloquence. And what eloquence did they have? Such eloquence that Ayatollah al uzma uh, Sayyid uh, Marashi Najafi writes in his introduction to Sahifa Sajjadiya that I sent a copy of this book to At-Tantawi who was the Dean of the Al-Azhar University, the biggest and most prestigious seat of Sunni scholarship in the world. 
after he inquired about whether the Shia have any other book than Nahjul Balagha. So I sent him a copy of this book. His response was nothing short of spectacular. He wrote back to the Sayyid telling him, I feel like I've wasted my entire life because I didn't know about this book. I wish I had known about the Sahifa when I was younger. I wish I could have spent more time studying the incredibly insightful, illuminating nuances of this one-of-a-kind document. And on that note, brothers and sisters, I'd like to suggest, and it's a mere suggestion for those who find themselves the resolve to serve the Ahlul Bayt in this world. Why don't we have experts in Sahifa Sajjadiyya? Why can't we have people who spend the prime of their life, not when they retire, not when they get old and have nothing else to do, but the prime of their life at the height of their youth, when their physical as well as intellectual capacities are at their maximum and optimum levels, to study this document, to reflect on this book, to try and discover its secrets, its gems. I swear, brothers and sisters, making such an effort is worth more than all of the academic accolades all of the honorific titles, and it's worth a thousand PhDs. This document alone, I have seen its power. First-hand experience. A professor at New York University, I met him, I think it was two or three years ago, and he converted, by the way, NYU is one of the top universities in the world, definitely in the top 20, I'm not sure of the exact ranking, and this person taught and was an educator at this institution. It has satellite campuses across the globe. When he was introduced to, to Sahifa Sajjadiyya, within two days, he came back and he said, I am not too acquainted with the author of this book. I don't know much about him. I have to study his biography. One thing I do know is that whoever he is, he has a direct link to God himself. This is not a normal document. This is not the work of man. We've seen artwork. We've seen geniuses. We've seen people whose intellectual abilities far exceed the average individual. But this, this is different. This is different. And that's the true nature of the Ahlul Bayt, brothers and sisters. Just a couple of months ago, I was in Washington for a conference a professor of quantum physics, in fact, he's the head of his department in Canada, had arrived to speak about Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, trying to examine, sallu ala Muhammad wa trying to use quotes of the Imam and link those quotes with cutting edge theories and hypotheses in the world of quantum physics and quantum mechanics. Not a Muslim himself, his only link to our faith is the fact that a colleague of his at that university, I believe the University of Calgary, gave him some of these quotes and hadiths of the Imam. I also shared a couple with him myself and he was absolutely flabbergasted as to how Amir al-Mu'mineen refers to the Big Bang and the beginning of the universe and the stages in which the universe expanded and so on and so forth. After giving his presentation, he came and sat down and we had a discussion. Then at the end of all that, he said, this Imam al-Sadiq of yours, he was either a god or godly. That's not what a human can produce, especially 14 centuries ago. And so why can't we have experts who specialize in Sahifa Sajjadiyya? That is enough to fill your entire life span. 
right? Why can't we have the, a sister, a brother? Why can't we have a group that gets together every week and discusses the beautiful supplications of Imam Zain al-Abideen on a weekly basis? and try and discover new theories about psychology, about human behavior, about religion, about religious philosophy and so forth. Instead of wasting our life on things that are peripheral at best and detrimental and dangerous at worst. This is the fasaha that Imam Zain al-Abadin is talking about. Eloquence that is unequaled, that is unparalleled. Then the Imam says, Shaja'a and Samaha, Samaha we also talked about. The ability to forgive and forget. And Shaja'a is the bravery which we also referred to. Finally the Imam says, وَالْمَحَبَّةَ فِي قُلُوبِ النَّاسِ We have been endowed with a natural inclination towards us, a God-given aptitude that makes people turn towards us, not because they know us, not because they stand to benefit from our love. In fact, they stand to suffer as a result of that. And yet people love us, and that love is irreplaceable. You cannot take it out of a heart that encompasses it. And it's interesting because I was reading a hadith, also by the sixth Imam, in which he says, Nahnu istijabatu du'a'i Ibrahim. We are the answer to a prayer made by Ibrahim of course, we know in the Quran that Prophet Ibrahim, when he left his wife Hajar and his son Ismail in the barren deserts of Mecca, he said, وَجْعَلْ أَفْئِدَةً مِّنَ النَّاسِ تَهْوِي إِلَيْهِمْ Make hearts of some people, not everyone. There's a very high bar to pass. If you're going to be a lover of the Ahlul Bayt, you're going to have to put your foot down on your ego, on your desires. You have to submit to the truth. وَجْعَلْ أَفْئِدَةً مِّنَ النَّاسِ تَهْوِي إِلَيْهِمْ Incline towards them. Because that was a part of the desert that no one passed through. And so death was all but inevitable as, th as far as they were concerned. Because no caravans would come through this extremely dry, desolate desert. And there was no water, there was no vegetation. بِوَادٍ غَيْرِ ذِي زَرَعْ The Prophet says. And so he made that prayer. But what's really interesting is this. I met a convert, a sister who had reverted to Islam. And I asked her, I'm always fascinated by stories of reverts. And I encourage each and every one of them to write about their experience and how they were able to navigate through the tumultuous waters of converting from one religion, from one, of, one way of life to another. So I asked her what it was that inspired her to become a Muslim and a Shia no less. She said, when I became a Muslim, I became a Shia immediately. I didn't have to go through the hoops. I said, how? She said, because of a verse in the Bible. The verse is in the book of Genesis, the first book in the Bible. And the address, for those who are interested, it's, is 1719. Abraham says to God, he says, God, I want you to bless my son Ishmael. Listen to this. So God says in response to Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, He says to him, as for your son, he speaks about Isaac first and then he says, as for your son Ishmael, I will bless him and I will draw him near to me and I shall grant him 12 princes from his lineage who will rule the earth. She said, I looked at this verse and I said to myself, who are these 12 princes? There are 12 tribes that came from the lineage of Ishmael. What's, by the way, I know I'm going on a bit of a tangent here, but the Bible is very critical of Ishmael. The Bible, one of the reasons we know for a fact that the Bible was tampered with, is some of the extremely critical and even vulgar references to Ismail al dabih And it makes absolutely no sense, even when you put it in the context of the Bible itself, there would be some praise to Hajar and then suddenly there is a unnatural pivot that attacks Ismail alayhi salam. And we know that that can't possibly be true except if we take into account the possibility, the very real possibility that this book was tampered with because whoever wanted to change the Bible, they did so with the intention of 
drawing the image of our Prophet and his tribe and his descendants in a negative light. And the only way they could do that is by tarnishing the image of Ismail But let's set all that, set all that aside. This verse, she said, this is what can, made me convert to Shia Islam, to the Ithna Ashari school of thought, because it's the only school that gives us the names, the descriptions, the beautiful prescriptions of the 12 Imams of the Ahlul Bayt, the 12 princes from the descendants of Ismail. Allah. Brothers, if you could try and get a little closer, I know the space is quite limited, but there is some space here. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ajil faraj. Jazakumullah khair. Lita'jili faraj sahib al-amri wa zaman طاووس يهل الجنة مهدي هذه الأمة الحجة ابن الحسن العسكري صلوا على محمد وآل محمد. So moving on to the topic of tonight, there's a question that's often presented. In a nutshell, it posits a challenge, and it's an age-old problem, which we have no qualms with, we have no problem with, but it does help to raise it and address it as best as we can in the short span of time that we have. The question in a nutshell is this. Why was Imam al Hussein the only member of the Ahlul Bayt, the only Imam to rise against the tyrant of his day? If the objective was to topple tyrannical rulers, then surely Imam al-Sajjad and the subsequent Imams should have carried that tradition on. After all, they face tyrants no less tyrannical, no less vile, no less vicious than Yazid himself. If you look at the rulers that came after Yazid, we're talking about Marwan, we're talking about Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, we're talking about Al Walid ibn Abdul Malik, we're talking about As Safah Abu al Abbas, we're talking about As Safah, his name literally means the one who sheds blood. And he was the founder of the Abbasid Caliphate. And then after, ha after him, Al-Mansur al-Dawaniqi, Al-Mansur who was referred to as Mu'awiyatu Bani al-Abbas. He was the Mu'awiyah of the Abbasids, right? Al-Mutawakkil al-Abbasi and others and others. Surely these were tyrants worthy of being toppled, worthy of being challenged by the Imams. Why didn't they? And to answer that question, I'll provide maybe two, possibly if we have time, three responses to it. The first is this, you see, the circumstances of Imam al Hussein were unique to the Imam himself. Those circumstances did not present themselves after the Imam. For example, Muawiyah tried to at least maintain a certain facade, a mirage of faith if you like. He tried to keep up appearances. He tried to lead prayers, he tried to go to Hajj. While he himself, there is not a shred of doubt that he has not even an iota of faith in his heart. He never did. At the same time, he tried to keep up appearances. He was a hypocrite, which in many ways makes him worse than Yazid. But at least a hypocrite doesn't expose their true vile nature. As someone who claimed to be the successor of the Prophet, he tried, as best as a hypocrite can, to pretend that he believed in what he preached, right? Although, as I said, he was without a doubt a disbeliever. In fact, Ibn Abi al-Hadid tells a very interesting story. Many of you are familiar with the punchline, but the context is also important. He says, and he was a Sunni historian and a commentator on Nahj al-Balagha, he says, that Al Mughira ibn Shu'bah, may Allah curse him for all eternity, because he was one of the people who participated in the raid and the ambush on the house of Amir al Mu'mineen and the beating of Fatima al Zahra. He had a son. His son is the one who tells the story. He says, One day, my father came from the house of Muawiyah, the palace of Muawiyah, and he was visibly upset. I said to him, What's wrong with you? Every night you spend long hours with your best friend Muawiyah. 
and you're always happy, you're always praising his genius, his political finesse, but tonight I see that you, you're really upset. He said, Ya Bunay, I just came back from the most disbelieving and the most vile and hateful people. He said, why? What's going on? He said, I went to Muawiyah tonight and I had some advice for him. I said to him, listen, you are getting older and at some point you will depart this world. What do you say you try and build a positive legacy for yourself? You know how politicians are always obsessed with their legacy, especially towards the end of their term, right? Let's build a library, let's do this, let's do that. They care about how they're going to be remembered. Even atheists, by the way, they care about how they're going to be remembered, which is kind of odd and ironic if you think about it. Like if you're going to turn into dust, what, what does it matter how people remember you, what they say about you? But deep down, they have an intrinsic belief that this world is not the end. So I said to him, leave a positive legacy. He said, what are you talking about? What do you mean? He said, look, you have put so much pressure on Beni Hashim and you have hurt them. You have hunted them down. You have killed many of them, many of their companions. How about you try and maybe show a more positive image of yourself towards them? Look after them, stop oppressing them, right? And that way, not because it's the right thing to do, but because you want to maintain an image of a just ruler. He said, Muawiyah turned to me, he said, listen, the first Khalifa came, he ruled for two years and he went, and not a soul cares about him anymore. The second Khalifa came, he ruled for 10 years, nobody remembers him now. The third one came, got killed, and everyone's happy that he's being killed. You think people will remember me as a good, just ruler? No, they won't. My legacy, I do not care about how people remember me. I only care about one thing. Do you know what that is? He said, Ha the bnu Abi Kepsha. It's an insult that I won't even attempt to translate. In reference to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, he said, This man. His name is mentioned five times a day when they recite the Adhan. Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. He said, My objective in life is not to leave a positive legacy, but to obliterate this name. I wish to eviscerate the memory of Muhammad and Al Muhammad, and that is my only objective in life. La wallah illa dafna and dafna. I shall bury that name. Which is why I often say to people that those who think Muawiyah did all the vile, grotesque, disgusting things in order to rule, they underestimate Muawiyah. Muawiyah wasn't so much interested in the treasures and the money and the pleasure and the women and the men and God knows what else. He wasn't interested in that as much as the idea of returning Islam back to its pre-Islamic pagan era. The idea was to destroy everything that the Prophet had built and to obliterate his name from the face of existence. That is Muawiyah, yes. But at the same time, he did go to the mosque, try and lead prayers go to the Hajj. So Yazid was different. This is one of the unique circumstances that Imam al-Hussein was faced with, but not the other members of the Ahlul Bayt. Imam al-Hussein himself declares, he says, Yazid, Rakibul Fujur, Sharibul Khumur, Qatilul Nafsil Muhtarama, wa mithli la yubayu mithlah. This man is an openly vile person. He's not, even a, he's not even being a hypocrite about it. He's not trying to keep up a religious facade. He would play chess, sip on beer, as he had the sacred head of Abba Abdullah al Hussein in a bowl right across from him, and then would spill the rest of the beer right next to the bowl, not inside. There are some red lines that Allah will never allow for those red lines to be crossed. But he would spill the beer, the leftover, next to that bowl of Imam al Hussein.
While all of this, while sitting on the member of Rasulullah, and he stroked the back of his pet monkey. So there's a big difference there. Imam al-Hussein says that since Yazid is now Ra'il Muslimin, since this man claims to be the Khalifa of Rasulullah, I cannot continue to tolerate any of this. I cannot practice taqiyya. I have to do what I have to do. وَأَنَا أَحَقُّ مَنْ غَيَّرُ And if anybody is supposed to stand up and make a difference, it's going to be Al-Husayn ibn Ali. خَرَجْتُ لِطَلَبِ الْإِصْلَاحِ فِي أُمَّةِ جَدِّي وَأَبِي أُرِيدُ أَنْ آمُرَ بِالْمَعْرُوفُ وَأَنْ هَا عَلَى الْمُنْكَرِ Imam Al-Husayn had no choice because Yazid was unlike any other tyrant before or after him. That's point number one. The circumstances were different. The second response is Imam al Hussein had companions who were also unique. There is a, an incredible hadith in which our sixth Imam lists the names of the upper echelon, the inner circle of each Imam under the title, under, under the heading of Al Hawariyun, the disciples of each Imam. Because you might have a companion, you might have someone who's acquainted with the Imam. Every once in a while, comes and sees the Imam. He's also good, very pious, religious. But then again, you have people like Maytham al-Tamar for Amir al-Mu'mineen. You have Amr ibn al-Hamiq al-Khuzai that I talked about the other night, right? You have Yahya ibn Umm Tawil. And you have companions who are just on a league of their own. Imam al Hussein, out of all of the other Imams listed in this hadith, each one had two, three, four, five companions. Imam al Hussein had over 70. And they were the ones who died on the plains of Karbala. And that is a big difference between this, the time of the other members of the Ahlul Bayt. For example, if you look at Amir al-Mu'mineen, right? Amir al-Mu'mineen came out 40 days. He would take the mistress of the women of the world, Fatima to Zahra, God's special secret, have her ride on the back of a mule, take her from door to door for 40 nights as they invited people to join their cause and pledge their allegiance to Amir al-Mu'mineen as opposed to the first Khalifa and not a single one responded to them. Not one. Then the Imam came out, he said, if anybody wants to come and join me, come tomorrow morning with your heads shaved. How many people showed up? Four. Only two months prior to that, 150,000 people witnessed Rasulullah raise the hand of Amir al-Mu'mineen so high, hatta bana bayadu ibtayhima. And tell everyone, man kuntu mawlah fahada aliyun mawlah. And today Amir al-Mu'mineen has only four companions. Even Salman, Salman al-Muhammadi, who had God's secrets transmitted to him by the Prophet and Amir al-Mu'mineen, Asrar al-Samawat, the hadith says, secrets of the heavens were shared with Salman. Even he was shaken a bit. Shaken in the sense that he says, he says to Sulaim ibn Qais, he says to him, I looked at Amir al-Mu'mineen with a rope tied around his neck, bi huwa wa ummi, being tied and pulled towards the masjid. And it's because Salman knows who Ali is and what Ali is capable of and Ali's position in the eyes of Allah, the Almighty. Salman says, I said to myself, if he commands this to come down on this, it would not hesitate what's happening. Amir al-Mu'mineen immediately turned to, um, to Salman and he said to him, Ya Salman, jaddid al bayah Salman, you need to re-pledge your allegiance, renew your alle allegiance. You're not supposed to think like this. You need to submit. Whatever I do, you submit to it. No questions asked. After all of this, Amir al-Mu'mineen has only four. One of the companions of Amir al-Mu'mineen, I'll just give you one example, was Ubaidillah ibn al-Abbas. Do you know who he was? Ubaidillah ibn al-Abbas was Amir al-Mu'mineen's cousin. First cousin. Not only that, so you've heard of Ibn Abbas, that's usually in reference to Abdullah ibn al-Abbas. There were two brothers. Abdullah was much closer to the Imam and whatnot. Ubaidullah was one of the commanders of the army of Amir al-Mu'mineen. He had three sons. 
they lived with their mother, they were in their home in Basra. Muawiyah sent one of his most vicious mercenaries by the name of Busr ibn Artat. He went to Basra, entered his home, slaughtered the three boys in front of their mother. So you have a first cousin of Amir al-Mu'mineen, a brave soldier, a commander, who's lost three of his children to Muawiyah's barbarity. Muawiyah bought his soul for a hundred thousand dinars. He sent him a package with a hundred thousand gold coins. He switched sides over to Muawiyah's side. Those were the companions of Amir al-Mu'mineen. Imam al-Hasan had companions who would send secret messages to, Mu to Muawiyah saying, would you like us to de deliver al-Hasan dead or alive? Whatever you choose, whatever you say. One of them turned to the, to the Imam, stabbed him in his thigh with his dagger and said, Ya Mudhil al -Mu'mini. These are the kinds of people that the other members of the Ahlul Bayt were dealing with. People whose beliefs were weak, their convictions were non-existent. And when the push came to the shove, they lost the test. They failed and they failed miserably. It's incredible brothers and sisters, right? You've probably heard the story of Sudayr al-Sayrafi who came to Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam he said to him, Ya ibn Rasulillah, la yajuzu lak al -quud. You're not, why are you sitting down? You need to rise. You have so many supporters and backers and companions and people willing to put their money, their lives. Why are you sitting down? Why aren't you revolting against the Khilafah of Bani al-Umayyah? Bani Umayyah are in a fledgling, weak, vulnerable situation. Now is the time. If you're going to do anything, now would be the time. The Imam said to him, Ya Sudair, how many companions do I have? He said, you have a hundred thousand. The Imam said, a hundred thousand? He said, two hundred thousand, in fact. I was being conservative. The Imam said, two hundred thousand? Are you sure? He said, Bal nisfud dunya. Half the world supports you. What are you talking about? The Imam said to Sudair, how about we go for a walk? Let's get up and walk. So they went outside. Sudair says that we got to a place where there was a, a shepherd with a bunch of little goats. The Imam pointed to those goats. He said to Sudair, if I had as many as these goats in companions, lama wasi'ani al-qu'ud ba'da dhalik. Yes, I would not sit down, I would rise and I would revolt. If only you can bring me as many as these goats. Sudair says, I looked, I counted them, there were 17 goats. The Imam is saying, if you can bring me 17, I'll rise. But if I'm going to end up having companions like those of Imam al-Hasan, those of Amir al-Mu'mineen, those of the other members of the Ahlul Bayt, what's the point? Which, by the way, on this point, brothers and sisters, and I mean no offense or disrespect to anyone, God forbid, I, I say this and I mean it, wallahi I mean it. I know for a fact that you are all better than me. But the problem is that we also say that we are here, the 12th Imam, why doesn't he reappear? We always pray for his reappearance, which is great, which we must, and we talked about this. But where do we stand on our loyalty to the Imam? Our loyalty to the Imam, you know when that's going to be tested? It's tested every day in your relations with your parents, your children, your spouse, right? Women are tested with how they treat their husbands, brothers and sisters, especially the sisters. May Allah bless you. Don't be taken up and eaten up by pop culture and the teachings that they provide. This feministic culture is incompatible with what Islam taught us. Islam is a religion that honors women more than any other culture and philosophy and ideology. And it's part of the honoring of women that women are given special status, a special set of duties. It's in the Quran. Men and women are different. And therefore, based on their differences, there are different responsibilities, different duties, different rights, and so on and so forth. Right? But to expect that both the husband and the wife to be exactly on equal footing in every single area is just nonsensical. The reason Islam says that a wife is supposed to obey her husband, and I know how the word obedience might make some people feel icky and uncomfortable, 
But these are the words of Rasulullah. These are the words of the Ahlul Bayt. I am not better than Fatima to Zahra, am I? Who says to Amirul Mu'mineen, Ya Aba al-Hasan, Ma ahittani kathibatan wala khainatan, wala khalaftuka mundhu aashartani. Ya Aba al-Hasan, I never disobeyed you. I never objected to you. Of course, I know what you're thinking. That is Amirul Mu'mineen. But so is she, Fatima to Zahra. Fatima. She has an opinion of her own, which is 100% valid. She's a, an infallible, inerrant member of the Ahlul Bayt. And yet she says, I never disobeyed you. You're being tested with all of this. There's a reason why the hadith says when Imam Zaman comes back, he goes to Kufa. We're not talking about Tel Aviv. We're not talking about Boston. We're not talking about London. Kufa, the center of the Shi'i scholarly tradition. Thousands of people will emerge and they will tell him, Ud ya ibn Fatima man haythu atayt, la hajata lanabik. Go back to where you came from. We don't need you because we have our own values. We have our own principles. We have our own lifestyles. You don't need to tell us. And believe you, me, brothers and sisters, Imam al Zaman is going to challenge your prevalent social constructs and your beliefs, not beliefs in Allah and the afterlife, your Islamic beliefs. I'm talking about beliefs, in other words, how you lead your life. The Imam will challenge those the way the previous prophets challenged the prevalent social norms of their day and were rejected as a result of them. Every prophet was rejected and denied and killed for the most part because they challenged social norms. They challenged prevalent ideas and beliefs. The Imam will do the exact same thing. So you better be ready. You better be ready to have a solid response to every question that's posed to you. When the Imam says, why did you do this? You better have a reference. Either a faqih told me to. A true, qualified jurist of the Ahlul Bayt school. Alim Rabbani. Alim Rabbani told me to do this. Fine. Or the Quran says this unequivocally. Or the Hadith says this unequivocally. If you have an answer for how you behave in your marriage life, in how you parent, in how you bring about your children and how you live with your friends and colleagues and where you work and what you do for a living and so on and so forth, you better have an answer. Otherwise, you will feel uncomfortable with the Imam's arrival. God forbid. God forbid. وَثَبِّتْ لِي قَدَمَ صِدْقٍ عَنْدَكَ مَعَ الْحُسَيْنِ وَأَصْحَابِ الْحُسَيْنِ الَّذِينَ بَذَلُوا مُهَجَهُمْ دُونَ الْحُسَيْنِ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ O oh Allah, keep me on this path. Keep me on the path where my heart is linked with whatever Imam al Hussein desires. Whatever Imam al Hussein wants. فَقَدْ أَجَابَكَ سَمْعِي وَبَصَرِي وَفُؤَادِي وَرَأِي In one ziyara we would say this, Now that I have not been able to respond to you, I was not there on the day of Ashura, here I am today at your beck and call with absolute 100% compatibility between my every view and yours. Your views supersede mine, whatever you say. Wallah latumahasun, the hadith says. By God, you will be sieved. You will be filtered. Sometimes, some of the things that we do, some of the mistakes that we make, right, deliberately or inadvertently, you can't fix them again, right? These marital problems that are often due to the fact that there is disobedience, there is, in, you know, incompatibility in the views and the wife doesn't want to give, come, you know, she doesn't want to uh, uh, concede and the husband doesn't want to concede and nobody is willing to make any compromises. Do you know what ends up being lost in the midst of all of this? It's the ch children. It's the next generation. It's the children who grow up either without one of their parents over their head because that marriage ended in the gutter and the courts and in divorce or because they end up living in a dysfunctional family Because these two are always bickering and fighting. Even if you feel that your husband is wrong, just give this one to him. Just let him get away with it. For the greater good. Anyway, that's a genuine fear, brothers and sisters, that when the Imam comes, we'll be in the same boat as those who abandoned Amir al-Mu'mineen. As for Imam al-Hussein, 
Those were the companions of the Ahlul Bayt. Look at the companions of Hussein. I'll mention just a couple of examples. John, the servant. Do you know what his actual job was on the day of Ashura? He was a slave. But he would fix the swords, sharpen the swords, fix the shields and the armor and whatnot. Imam al Hussein came to him. He said to him, Ya Joan, Laqad ji'tana talaban lil You came and joined us, came to my family, because you wanted a good life. And what life is better than one in the company of Aba Abdullah al Hussein? And that's why you came. But today is not a day to expect a life that is comfortable. Today is a day when I will be killed. And there's no reason for you to be killed with us. You can get away with it. You can go. You can run. John began pleading with Imam al Hussein, begging him, Ya Aba Abdullah, I know. I know I'm not worthy. I know that my blood is not worthy of being mixed with yours. I know that I'm not someone, I can't be proud of my lineage like others perhaps. Arabs were very proud of their lineage. I can't do that. They're proud of the fact that they're white. I'm black. I know I'm not worthy. Breathe on to me the aroma of paradise. Which is why they say that after he was killed, remember how he said to the Imam that I have a bad stench? I smell, I'm not the cleanest person, I, this is what I do. After he was killed, anyone who passed through the location of his body would smell the most beautiful aroma of paradise. That's a statement we should be making to Imam al Hussein ourselves. Ya Aba Abdullah, I know I'm sinful. I know I'm disobedient. I know I'm nowhere near the caliber of the slaves, of the servants, of the descendants of anyone of your, of your companions. You show me the way. Help me anchor my boat to yours. That's one of the companions. This is what Imam al Hussein had. This is why he was able to rise and not the other members of the Ahlul Bayt. One more example is Shakir. Abbas, excuse me, Abbas al-Shakiri was a person who came to Imam al Hussein. He had a friend, a lifelong childhood friend by the name of Shawdab. They both came out of Kufa together. As they were going towards Kufa, they were speaking. Imagine having like your best friend, someone you've spent your childhood with. And so they're talking to each other, encouraging each other. And soon enough, they realize that they don't need to encourage anyone. So Abbas then said to his friend Shawdab, he said to him, look, on the day of Ashura, when the going gets tough and when the fight begins, I'd like you to go and get killed before I do. He said, why? He said, Allah, because I love you and because of that relationship that I have with you, I wish to feel the pain of losing my friend on top of dying myself on top of dying myself, right? SubhanAllah. He came to Imam al-Hussein on the day of Ashura. He said to him, Ya Aba Abdullah, Laysa ala wajh al -ardh. There is no one on the face of this, this earth that I love than, more than you. Walaw kana li ghayra nafsi hadih. And if I had more than myself, my soul, and I could give it in your way, wallahi la fa'alt, I would. But what can I do? I only have one life, one soul, one body. And that I am more than willing to lay before you. When he went out to fight the enemy, they were so scared and terrified of him. They literally said, Hada asadun min usud al Hussein. Be careful. This is one of Hussein's lions. He's going to obliterate you. Don't get near him. He went towards them. He said, leave Hussein, come and get me. They wouldn't. So that's when he took his armor off. He threw his helmet away and he charged into the battlefield saying, come and get me. And that's when they told him, Ajuninta ya Abis, have you gone completely mad? He said, naam, inna hubb al Hussein, ajannani. The love of Hussein. The love of Hussein, and I said this a couple of nights ago, if you remember, when you can instill that kind of love, 
The tornado that swirls around you will get tougher and more violent. The problems, the tests, it'll get worse and worse, but you'll be able to come out with flying colors. You'll be able to pass any obstacle, any test. I mentioned when uh, Amr ibn al-Hamiq al-Khuza'i said to Amir al-Mu'mineen, if you ask me to empty out an ocean cup by cup, I will do it. I won't feel an iota of exhaustion because I have your love in my heart. That's true love. These were the companions of Abu Abdullah al Hussein, and so that made all the difference. Imam al Hussein was able to rise. Imam al Hussein was able to carry out his mission while other members of the Ahlul Bayt did not. Finally, and I'll conclude with this response to the question that I posed earlier, the blood of Imam al Hussein was so sacred that his martyrdom on the day of Ashura, along with the massacre of his family and companions, along with the trials of Lady Zainab and Imam Zain al-Abideen and the other members of the Ahlul Bayt was more than sufficient to create a light, a fire that will never be extinguished. إِنَّ فِي قُلُوبِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ حَرَارَةً لِقَتْلِ الْحُسَيْنِ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ لَنْ تَبْرُدَ أَبَدًا This fire will never be extinguished. Imam al Hussein has such magnetism, brothers and sisters, that until the day of judgment, his name, his legacy, his legend, his story, his saga, his saga will be more than enough to guide every single soul on this planet. Just look at Ziyarat al arbai And I know we've talked about this. But I just want to encourage those, God forbid, if there's someone who hasn't been to Ziyarat al arbai or if you're unsure about whether you should go this year or not, just look at Ziyarat al arbai a tiny glimpse of what Imam al Hussein can do to an entire nation. Turn normal people just like you and I, people who are fallible, people who, are, who make mistakes, Iraqis in particular having been subjected to persecution for centuries, sometimes might have a difficult temper, let's just say, but when it comes to Ziyarat al arbain every single one of them becomes like an angel. Every one of them. Anyone who's ever been to Ziyarat al arbain knows what I'm talking about. Serving total strangers with everything that they have. Everything. Right? How you're able, again, this is the grandeur, this is the miracle of Hussein. how you're able to have over 20 million people go to Karbala and no one experiencing as much as a nosebleed. How all of these people come back satisfied and satiated and happy and spiritually uplifted and fed. How is this all possible? Do you remember a few years ago? I think it was 2017 when a bunch of singers and so-called rock stars in the United States threw a party in the Caribbean in some island called the Fire Festival. Is anyone familiar with that? The Fire Festival, which was bankrolled and organized by the most sophisticated group of people, people whose job was to organize these large-scale events like concerts and whatnot, right? Then they got all these so-called Instagram influencers, all these models to come and promote the festival and do ads and they ended up getting so many people signed up it was crazy and then 4,000 people go went to the island 4,000 they couldn't accommodate them they couldn't feed them it was such a disaster lawsuits continue to this very day they're still suing them because they couldn't feed or clothe or shelter 4,000 people compare that with the millions of people who go to Karbala every year Yes, the BBC is not concerned about that. Yes, other mainstream media outlets are not concerned about that. And we know why. We know why. Because you let that on your screen and people will be fixated and obsessed with the love of Imam al-Hussein, part of which has permeated through the hearts of these Zuwar, making them risk everything in going to Ziyara and visiting the grand mausoleum and sacred shrine of Aba Abdullah al Hussein, where thousands of angels are circumambulating. Yabkoon, Layla Nahar, Shu'thun, Ghubrun, Ila Yawm al Qiyam. That is the miracle of Hussein, brothers and sisters. 
May Allah bless you all. And so Imam Zain al-Abideen, while he did not rise against the tyrants of his day in the manner that Imam al Hussein did, but Imam Zain al-Abideen was continuing that tradition of sculpting companions and men and women who could carry the lantern, carry the torch throughout the generations. Imam Zain al-Abideen was busy in sculpting the personalities of such individuals like Abu Hamza al-Thumali and Abu Khalid al-Kabuli and Yahya ibn Um Tawil and others and others. That's what the Imam was doing. And in doing so, because Imam Hussein's legend, as I said, was enough and sufficient to keep this flame burning forever, the Imams simply referred people back to Imam al Hussein. They simply encouraged people to remember Imam al Hussein, to hold gatherings, to cry. Ya ibn Shabib, in kunta baki an li shay, fabki ala jaddi al Hussein, fa innahu dhubiha kama yudbahu al kabsh. A lifetime of pain and misery. Bi abi anta wa ummi, ya ibn Rasul Allah. A lifetime of weeping and crying for Imam al Hussein until Al Walid ibn Abd al Malik, alayhi al A'in Allah. Al Mas'udi says that this man, kana taghiyan, zaliman, fasiqan, fajira. What a tyrant this person was. Al Dhahabi says, he says that this man once said that. I cannot live in a world where Ali ibn al Hussein is alive on this earth. La yasa'un al hayat wa Ali ibn al Hussein mawjudun fi hadhi al dunya. I can't bear to see this man receive so much love and admiration and adoration and respect from everyone. I am the king, but I also wish to be the imam. I wish to be the center of respect and adoration. Why does he get all of this and not I? And so he sent poison to his governor in Medina and to have him administer the poison in Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam When the poison was administered, our Imam, your Imam, brothers and sisters, died as a martyr, just like his ancestors, just like his descendants, the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam Then Jabir ibn Abdullah We gathered around for the Imam to be prepared for burial. His son Imam al Baqir was the one washing his father's body. He put up a partition, a curtain. We were standing behind the curtain as Imam al Baqir was washing his father. Suddenly we heard Imam al Baqir burst into tears. We said, has something happened? The Imam didn't say a word. He simply sat on the ground and sobbed out loud. When he finished, he came out. He was still crying. We said to him, Ya ibn Rasulullah, why did you cry? He said, when I was washing my father, ra'aytu athar al after 30 years, I could still see the marks left by the chain that left my father bleeding from the neck down. 
I say, uh, I address my Imam Muhammad ibn Ali al Baqir. I say to him, Ya ibn Rasulullah, but this is not new to your family now, is it? Wasn't it your father, Amir al Mu'mineen, who was bathing his wife, Fatima al Zahra? فَإِذَا بِهِ يَنْفَجِرُ بِالْبُكَاءِ أسماء بنت عميس said يا أمير المؤمنين why do I see you putting your head against the wall and crying out loud do you know what the Imam said أجركم الله يا مؤمنين رأيت خسفا في موضع الضير I saw an indentation on where the rib is. In other words, the rib of Fatima wasn't only cracked, it was entirely broken. Aywa Fatima ta wa madhluma ta ya ya Amir al-Mu'mineen cried and cried for his beloved wife Fatima to Zahra and why wouldn't he? But I say, I have another message for Amir al-Mu'mineen. Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, la'in kasaru dhal'an min al-tuhri wahidayan, fahadha Hussainun kasaru minhu adhlu'ayan. Awali, awali, dhal'a wahid ya Ali. وهد حالك ضلع واحد يا علي وهد حالك شاض لو أحسن شو تسوي لك آه after they killed أبا عبد الله the accursed عمر cried out ألا من طلب الجائزة فليدس على جسم الحسين ten people came forward one historian says one of them says that I looked at them they were all children of out of wedlock they came and trampled over the body of Abba Abdullah after they were done they dismounted their horse Allah ya sahib al zaman Omar cried out اقلبوه now turn him around ايوا ويلاه وحسينا they did all of this as Zainab called out اليس هذا الذبيح ابن رسول الله اليس هذا القتيل ابن فاطمة الزهر Everyone call out three times, Wa Husayna.